Good afternoon. I want to thank you all for coming out on this rainy afternoon. And it is my true joy to see you here. But you know, I wonder what are you thinking about Nance? What have you heard about Nance? Is it that she is the first African American or enslaved person to be freed by Abraham Lincoln, your true son of Springfield? Or have you heard about the trials in her life, how she actually got to the point of Abraham Lincoln representing her cause in court? Well, let me back up a bit and start from the beginning. I am Nance Leggins Costly, sometimes Nance Leggins Cox, sometimes Nance Leggins Cornwell. It depends on who is talking about me as to how they want me to be known. I was born into slavery. My parents were slaves, Randall and Anashe Leggins in Vandalia, Illinois. In fact, the building that I was born in was used to make laws that made my life pure hell. In this building, laws were made in Illinois to disguise slavery as indentured servitude. Now, that kind of sounds like it was something that people agreed to doing. Oh, indenture me as your servant for my life. But it was not. In most cases, and I would say in all cases, it was involuntary. Even though on the books in Illinois, it says that slavery and involuntary servitude will not exist in this state, meaning here in Illinois. But it did for years. And I was part of that system. I was enslaved, but actually, involuntary servitude to Mr. Cox, Colonel Cox. He had fought in the war, was an Indian fighter, a very well-known man in Illinois. In fact, he was persuasive in moving the state capital from Kaskaskia to Vandalia, where I was born and where we lived. He owned a hotel there. He was part of the federal government. He was also part of the federal banking system. Then he decided that he was going to move to Springfield because he wanted to move the capital from Vandalia to Springfield. He thought he had that much power. In fact, he did for a while. So he loaded up his wagon, all of his furnishings, his family, his properties, including myself and my sister, Dice. We were his indentured servants. We came to Springfield, 70 miles away. Oh, it was a beautiful place, beautiful wildflowers, fresh water, streams, all types of wildlife, just a beautiful place. Pretty much uninhabited, too. Colonel Cox decided to build the biggest log cabin in the area, a two-story structure, impressive. He also wanted to build an ox mill across the street to grind corn. He also wanted to establish a distillery to make that golden liquid whiskey. So in order to do those things, he needed money. So because he was part of the whole banking system, 
it's alleged that he mismanaged some of that money. He also borrowed money from the current sheriff, John Taylor. He borrowed money from the richest well-known man in the mid area, Mr. Cornwell, who was a gun seller. So he borrowed more than $500 from these people. And then the banks failed. So the bank decided that they were going to come after their money from him. Of course, there was no money. Then Sheriff Teller wanted his money. And then Mr. Cornwell wanted his money. So in the intervening time, because Colonel Cox had this distillery that made the liquid gold, he developed quite a taste for it and became addicted to it. He developed something called dipsomia. That means he became an alcoholic and usually blacked out and could not remember anything that had happened during the time he was overindulging in his own product. So as a result of all of this borrowing money and his alcoholism, he lost everything. So he was sued by the bank, by Judge Taylor, and by Mr. Cornwell. They took him to court. So Judge Taylor, Sheriff Taylor, and Mr. Cornwell decided that they were going to split up Colonel Cox's possessions, his house, his land, his property, his animals, and his two indentured servants, myself and my sister Dice. So Mr. Cornwell wanted the house because he lived seven miles outside of town, so he wanted to be closer in. So he wanted the house and me. He had just gotten married, so he wanted me as a servant and maid to his new bride, Anna Elizabeth. Judge Taylor wanted the ox mill and the whiskey distillery. So the other things were sold at auction. And then I was purchased from Cox by Cornwell for $151. So then the governor at that time knew that Colonel Cox could be difficult to deal with and losing all of his possessions like that, he felt he was gonna need someone in the territory who could handle him. So he brought in a man named Mr. Howard, who had also been an Indian fighter, and he figured he could handle Cox. He made Howard the corner of the area. So on the day that all the possessions were auctioned off, and Cornwell purchased, 150, purchased me for $151. Cornwell approached me and asked me, because by law, in order to be an indentured servant, you had to agree to go with the person who had purchased you. I told him, no, I do not want to go live with you. I will not live with you. So he told Howard, Take her to the salt house. Now the salt house is this little building for the whole community where they put the fish and the meat to cure it and preserve it for the whole community. It had no windows, no air, nothing, just a building with a door. He shackled my hands, shackled my feet, and drugged me off yelling and protesting and screaming to the salt house where I stayed for six days against my will. During this time, the Winnebago Indian War broke out up in northern Illinois. So word came to the Springfield area that they needed men to come and help fight. So all the men, able-bodied men, went, Sheriff Taylor, Cornwall, and Cox all went. 
And as it turned out, they did not have to enlist because of their jobs. So they came back. But while they were gone, someone had the common sense to let me out. So when I was freed, I went back to the Cox home. Howard, the coroner, was furious when he got back and found out that someone had freed me. So he went to court to get me back for Cornwell. And he won. So I had to go back and live with Cornwell. In the meantime, Colonel Cox's mother decided that she wanted to get the family property back. Now this begins the multitude of court hearings that I went through, five all together, before I was actually free, if you want to call it free. This was the first one. Grandma Jane decided she would buy the house back and make it into a boarding house. So she obviously was going to need somebody to help her there. And she also wanted to get me back. Colonel Cox hired an attorney to plead his case in court. This went on for several months. And then this judge wanted to know, was this person, this servant, of legal age to be sold at that time? So he asked Cornwell, was she of legal age, and did she agree to go and be your servant? Cornwell didn't know, so he instructed him to go down to Vandalia, look up the records to find out when I was born to see how old I was. I needed to be either an adult or a child. The current case was called Nance, a colored woman versus Cornwell. Now, Cornwell went down to Vandalia. When he finally came back, he had this information that I was born in 1813. So that made me 13 years old when this happened. Also, my father had died and my mother had been sold off to a slaveholder in Kentucky. So by Illinois law, I was an orphan and could not be sold because I was not of legal age. So this judge decided that I could not be sold. So then Cox appealed that. So this new case, the second one, was now called Nance, a colored girl against Howard. That makes it a bit different. So fortunately, and maybe not so much, the judge that was hearing this case, Judge Lockwood, was anti-slavery and pro-abolitionist. He heard the case. Cox got up and told all of this stuff about how Howard had beat me and drugged me and physically mistreated me as he drugged me to the salt house, which is all true. And then the judge asked me to tell what happened. So I told the judge I did not agree to go. I was taken there it was trespass by force. I said no to Cornwell that I did not want to go live with him. In the meantime, Howard never, uh, the coroner Howard never did testify because he knew everything that we said was true. But the judge decided that since I was only 13 and that all the black laws had been passed throughout the South and the state allowing slave hunters to just pick up anybody that they thought could be a slave and take them back South and sell them, that I would be subject to that as well. In addition, 
he did not want me to go back to Cox because he felt that Cox would probably sell me again to pay some of his debt. So the judge ruled in favor of Cornwell. I had to stay there. The judge said, until this child reaches legal age of 18. So I was with Cornwell again. In the meantime, Cornwell decided that he was going to move to Pekin, Illinois. Well, it wasn't Pekin then. He was going to move up toward Tremont because he wanted to settle another town. He was going to settle and establish Pekin. So we moved up there. And I worked for Cornwell, made him wealthy, and he was able to buy more and more property to expand his wealth. And then cholera broke out, and malaria, and other diseases broke out in the area. A lot of people died, including his young bride, Anna Elizabeth, the woman for whom he wanted me as a gift to his bride. When she died, it destroyed his life. And then he decided he was going to move to Texas. By this time, I was 23. Texas, a huge slave state, I was totally frightened. I knew I did not want to go to Texas with them. So I decided I was going to have my first child. And by the time he was actually ready to leave, it was became apparent that I was with child. So he knew that he, a 65-year-old white man, traveling on a riverboat with this young 23-year-old pregnant slave female would really garner a lot of unwanted attention. So he didn't know what to do. He couldn't just leave, leave me there because it was illegal in the state of Illinois to abandon your indentured servitude person. So in order for him not to miss the riverboat going down south, he made a hasty plan with his business partner, a Mr. Bailey, who owned the general store in town. He made a plan with Bailey to sell me for $400 for a year while Cornwall would be gone. He said he'd be back in a year. But he did not come back because a month after he boarded the riverboat, he succumbed to one of the diseases and died. So I was left with Bailey. Now here comes the second court hearing. Cornwell's estate approached Bailey about the $400 that he had promised to pay for me. Bailey said he was not paying anything because I did not work at all as a servant. I was too pregnant to do anything, so there were no services rendered. So Cornwell's son took him to court for the money. Bailey lost that case. Then he remembered his good friend, Abraham Lincoln, from the war. He contacted Abraham Lincoln to represent him in court, so he appealed the verdict on the case he lost. Lincoln used a lot of the same language Neither service slavery or indentured servitude is legal in this, in this state and will not exist. He used that three times during that court hearing to impress upon the judge that there was a legal basis for it. And plus, a few months prior to our hearing, the hearing with Adams against Armistead out in Boston had taken place 
and the court ruled in agreement with Joseph Senke, who had led a mutiny, mutiny on the Amistad. So that gave him some basis for some cases being won on the side of colored people in this country. What made this case so outstanding for Lincoln is that no other attorney would touch it. No attorney, white attorney, would do it because it would ruin their reputation and they felt they could not have a chance to win in court representing a slave or a black person. So this is what made it so outstanding for Lincoln. He used some of the same laws that had been established by the state to win this case, and he did win. So finally, Nance, and by then, her eight children, because before the last case went to court, Lincoln felt that here she was a woman with children and unmarried, that the court would look more favorably upon me if I were married. So before we went to trial, I trotted off to the courthouse and married Benjamin Costley. And that's how I got that second last name. So I was married at that time. And by the time, which would have been the fifth case for me, actually finished in court and was in my favor, I was a married woman with eight children. And that is very brief for you, the story of Nance and Abraham Lincoln. But I have a question for you. Out of the five court hearings, were they all about getting freedom for Nance, or were they all about getting justice and property for the men who had had the property be in the beginning. So what were the cases about? Was it about her freedom, or was it about getting the property back to the white men who owned it? I thank you for listening, and I hope you have some good questions for me. Thank you.